Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. We'll see how this all ties in because as you and I are talking, my data will start making more sense to me. But a lot of this, after I watched the documentary, now the data makes sense. Okay? Yes. Uh, with yes. a lot of this. So you guys, um, if you have not watched part one of Mara Murray, I'm going <laughs> to link that down in the description box below because I don't, that was almost a two hour video that I made going through everything with this case and all the, the, the many, the spinning parts, as we say a lot that are around this case. Um, but if you are familiar with the Mara Murray case, or you've listened, you've watched other documentaries about it, or listen, there's a podcast about it, then obviously you don't need to watch part one. I put part one up just for the people who, who are not familiar with this case, which Jessica, you were not familiar with this case, were you? I'd never heard of it. No. I'm not familiar. And I and I look into missing persons cases, but see, I never know that I'm getting a missing persons case because I'm doing coordinate remote viewing where I'm tasked with some coordinates. Sometimes I never find out what that target was. Okay. But uh, but I do uh, get missing people and cold case targets pretty, pretty often. Yeah. And I want to be very clear, guys. We um, because this is a, a almost a 20 year old case. Um, we've talked about this before with like any time. I think Jessica and I are kind of on the same page when it comes to divination, when we're dealing with other people, there are laws of consent. And so, you know, people do have the right to go missing, but from my research that I've done into this case and my own speculation, I don't think that she's alive. I think, and I said that in part one, I think that she is dead. And so we are dealing with a uh, closure for a family, figuring out what happened to her, um, I think I know what happened. I think I have theories about what happened to her. And I also think there's this term called Occam's razor. Have you heard of this, Jessica? Mm -hmm. Where it's yes. like basically the most likely scenario is probably what happened, right? And we're yeah. going to get into all the different uh, theories and what Jessica... So Jessica, do you first want to go ahead and give give what... I, I'll, I'll throw the pictures because guys, she sent me last night, she sent me all of her her notes data. to her data. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know what you call it. Um, and I was like laying in bed reading through it. I almost got emotional because you hit, and I knew when I knew when I was reading it, that you had no idea what it is. You were actually like, you were just writing information down and because I know the case and this case has haunted me for years now, for some reason, this case has really, I, I think a lot of people are very haunted by this case. Um, when I was reading your, your data, I was like, Holy shit. She hit, she hit it. And I don't even think she knows what it is she hit. So that's when I told you, Mara Murray, go look her up. And you said you watched some stuff this morning. So do you want to go through what you got first? And then we can kind of have a conversation about all the theories that people have and how this, some make sense and some don't. And what, what we think yes. is going on with Mara at the time of her disappearance. Oh, yeah, totally. Okay, so you had given me some coordinates. Okay, and they were 2244. 8877. And, uh, and that's what you gave me. And, uh, and it took me a couple days to get around to remote viewing this because I do a lot of remote viewing and I can only do so much in a day. And so I did this one. I think I just did this yesterday, actually. And um, yeah, so I, I went in not knowing what this was and I will go over some of my sensory data and then I'm going to go over some of my analytic overlay data and, uh, and then we're going to talk about that stage three drawing I did, which was really interesting. Uh, and then we'll go over my stage four data. Now, um, so remote viewing is locating a target that is unknown 
that I have n- no idea what it is uh, by co- and this is coordinate remote viewing. There's different modes of remote viewing. Uh, the one that I did for this target specifically was coordinate remote viewing. And I like doing that because you can write everything down. It has a date and a timestamp on it when I did it. And uh, and it's it's all there cut and dry for, for me to hand in to a detective or the family or whoever's tasking me with these targets. Okay. And um, like I said, I did not know what this target was. And so... Uh, I immediately, when I'm remote viewing, I have like charts, I write out um, ideograms, it's like automatic writing, and I start flooding in, or the matrix, like I'm starting to like get all this information that floods in when I sit down to do these targets, and I just write it down, and there's a place for everything for me to write down. So, um, I could, do you want me to give you like an overview before I get into the data? Uh, of, of, question I have, Jessica, because I, I hope you don't mind me saying this to our audience. You said that you got very emotional remote viewing this 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 person. You didn't know obviously what it what it was, but um. So my question is, and I I because I get emotional with this case. This is a very emotional case, and I and maybe it's because for me, Mora was like nine months older than me, and so looking back at two thousand four when she went missing, um knowing what the world was like then with without you know knowing being that age myself and how sometimes you blow up when you're in your early 20s sometimes things happen and you think that's the end of the world when it's actually not the end of the world you know and just knowing the stress that she was under i can totally understand getting emotional so when you were remote viewing are you just given information or are you viewing the situation through the target's eyes both all of it. Yeah. And um, I'm even able to get in and and see through the if, if I'm detecting a person in the environment, I'm able to do what we call a deep mind probe. So I'm able to go in there and actually ask them questions and get answers. I mean, I've located uh, missing people like that before who are deceased. And I have to give um, I have to put put out a little note here for everybody. Um a lot of, mo- I'm going to say 99% of the targets that I've been tasked with with missing persons, uh, they were deceased. Okay. So a lot of the people that I am tasked with uh, um, have died. And, uh, and a lot of times I am locating, uh, I'm talking to them, asking what happened. Uh, I can have them lead me to kind of like the area where their body is or like landmarks and things like that. Like I can see. Uh, so it's just a, it's a long process. Remote viewing is a process because, and it's very draining, by the way, uh, super draining, especially when it comes to uh, violent crimes. Okay. And missing children and things like that. Um, I have been asked, you know, when I, I never went public as being a remote viewer for at least 10 years. And, um, and because I'm a, I'm a Bigfoot field researcher, first and foremost, and I was taught remote viewing through that research. Okay. From the research that we do. And, um, people started, would attack me occasionally when I first went public and they said, why are you not finding all these missing people you talk about on these national parks? I do. Okay. I do. I just don't talk about it publicly. And, um, and it's, it's so draining, Bryce. It's, it's really draining, um, to, to do things like this. Well, so, there is, but, and I, I'm actually hoping, and there, there is a, the family does run a, uh, a website, um, about, about more trying, cause the family is still looking for closure. And I know that there's been another big site. There's been lots of psychics who works, who worked this case. One of them being a big one, Alison Dubois, who the, the show medium was about her. And she actually picked up a lot of the same things that Jessica picked which we're going to get into what Jessica picked up on. And she said something that she's looking through Maura's eyes. And, and she was explaining a lot of terror, a lot of fear. And she also, in one of the docu-series of the interviewer, she actually looks at the camera when they say what happened to her. And she goes, are the parents going to, I'm not, I get, I kind of just got like a wave of emotion when I said that, are the parents going to be watching this? Because there is a sensitivity to the fact that this is a human being. And there mm-hmm. are family members out there that have to live with the knowledge that they don't know what happened to their sister or their daughter and the family from what i from the re through the the interviews that i've seen with like the father the mother has since the mother actually passed away on mara's birthday five years after her disappearance which is wild so the father is the one that's still going strong trying to get answers for for mara's disappearance and the family from what i have seen in their interviews do accept that she is probably dead 
um they uh they so they accept that they understand that that's probably what happened to her um uh, again you guys there's a huge other theory uh especially by james renner i was telling uh this guy just ordered his book a uh, true true crime addict um how i lost myself in the mysterious disappearance of mar murray and he is the one that really has this big theory that she ran off to canada started a new life in canada and I, I said this in part one. I think I said this in part one. I don't think James Renner is a bad person. I think he just got caught up. He's a father himself, I believe. I think human nature, we want to believe that when someone goes missing, that we, we want to we want to give them that underdog story of like they 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 conquered whatever it is. They they have a new life now. But they but a lot of people have, sp have spoken to experts who specialize in and people who disappear willingly. And that is very hard to pull off. It is very hard for someone to pull off disappearing willingly and changing their identity and not having any contact whatsoever with their outside, with with the outside, with the world they knew before. And and so I just want to I want to put that out there. Um, and you could see with Alison Dubois as well when they were working with her, just how her face would change, experiencing what Mora would have been experiencing just moments before um, I believe she was murdered. I think that's what you, the consensus that you have to Jessica is that she was probably murdered. Um, and with that being said, I do plan on sending a link to this video to uh, the family, not for any other reason, just for them. I'm not asking them to call my channel. I'm not asking any, I just want to make that very clear. It's not for any type of publicity. I just, I think Jessica, you as and me and most of our audience watching as a human being, if it, we were in their shoes, would want I would want my sister's body. I would want to be able to put everything to rest um, and give her whatever type of burial or, or service that that she has not. I want to make that clear too. From what I understand, she has not been legally declared dead yet, um, which I believe that they've done that uh, strategically. Because I think it's like after four years or something, there's, there's like a time period where you could legally declare someone dead, even if you don't know they're dead. Um, I think they've done that in order to keep the to, to keep it so it doesn't get archived, right? To, to still keep it a missing person's case in hopes that the police will actually um, do more, which we'll get into the police later because that's a whole other can of worms right there. But um, but yes, I, I, I get what you're saying. To make a long story short, Jessica, I totally get We absolute respect to the life that was lost um, and to the family that uh, and the friends that have suffered that loss and don't have any answers as to what happened to their loved one. And if 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 Jessica's remote viewing can help the family or anybody find closure or find the body, then I think it's fair to say, Jessica, that 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 was what we want to happen in order for them to have that closure that they need for their their daughter and for their sister and their friend, you know, so. Mm -hmm. All right, girl, I'm going to hand it over to you now and I'm going to put the camera on you and let you just get tell the audience what you got. Okay, so this this was a really hard target for me to do. Okay, it didn't start off that way because I didn't know what this was. And um, and so I'm seeing um, I'm sensing all this sensory data is coming in. Um, it started off seemingly not terrible in uh some of my sensory data included um adorned or adored uh covered flighty amazing happy okay and i was i was like oh, okay this is going to be a cool target it seems pretty happy uh happy and then i and then and then some more data came in and i got disjointed um breathing alone graceful spinning lunging covert and then I got dragged and abused. Okay, and uh, and this is not this is not going to be a super easy thing to talk about today. And uh, and I want to be very it's it is very sensitive. And so um, I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to disclose every single thing that I experienced because it's 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 pretty bad. It's pretty rough. Okay, uh, but I was uh, uh, so me trying to make sense of some of that data. I write down it's called analytic overlay, and uh, and some of the things I wrote were um, um, I was picking up on like jewels okay like so I, I got adorned and so i was seeing like jewels and stuff i don't know um i heard happy wife happy life i you know that may have nothing to do with anything but um, i wrote that down and then i heard um upside down or upside down world we live in upside down world and then i picked up on breath work because i was hearing and sensing breathing and uh and it was like control breathing um and then i heard solemn 
like being alone, like solemn. And then I heard checked. Um, and then I was picking up on being athletic, somebody that was super athletic, uh, potentially a dancer. I was even picking up on like ballet or some kind of dancer, some kind of sport. Okay. Uh, where you're, well, that uh, goes in, I'm just going to, I was like, when you said breath work, I got chills up and down my spine. She was a long distance runner, like one of the top runners in high school. She got scholarships and a lot of people's, when you said breath work, a lot of people, that's why people think she ran across the Appalachian mountains in the dead of winter because she was an athlete. And so she could take in more oxygen running up the mountains, which we'll get into. But when you said breath work, I was like, holy, holy shit. Yeah. She was, she was a, a very hardcore, like I would say borderline Olympic level athlete. So yeah, very physically fit. So anyway, all right, keep going, girl. Sorry. I was just like, boom, okay. that, that is that. Yeah, she was. Okay. So I was just, I was picking up on someone that was super athletic and, uh, and I, and, and I wrote down, this is what I wrote down because I, you know, I, I'm just, putting out anything that comes into my head or I'm sensing, I write it down. I don't discount anything. Okay. So I wrote down dancer dancing. I even wrote belly dancing. Okay. Uh, in ballet, uh, I heard a uh, hidden treasure, hidden value, hidden talent. Okay. Hidden value. Then my data, this is still, this is like my stage one and two data for the first page that I got. Uh, and then it kind of went, it, it started, the data started changing a little bit. And I actually wrote down the word Muslim. I wrote down drag down. And then I heard clear audiently put in her place. And then I got, I heard knocked out. So knocked out. Okay. And, um, and I wrote what is called stage three data. I wrote down what I thought was a hat with a, a rose on it, like a flower. Um, but after I went back and analyzed the data, I do believe that is a, a grave marker. Okay, I think I wrote down a grave marker. And uh, I'm not sure if you have the data to show the audience today. Um, but there is um, there is a drawing and also like a, a squiggly line almost looks like a, a portal or something. Or that could represent like, I'm going to say breath work or something. But I did I did some sketching. That's just part of remote viewing. You just sketch. Okay, you make a sketch. Okay, so in my stage four... Uh, on my second page of data, I, okay, w once I started the last bit of that data and I was picking up that somebody was dragged and abused, okay, um, well, I hadn't gotten to the that part yet, but yeah, uh, I heard uh, put in her place and knocked out. I, I, I got very emotional. And, uh, and actually, there's a place to write that to you on the data. And I was, I was crying, upset, devastated, and I was very sad. Okay. For the entire rest of this target that I was in the session that I was in, I was devastated. Okay. Like I couldn't stop crying. And, um, and so I heard, okay, some of my sensory data that I was sensing was tempted. And I got like the word temptress. Okay. Like temptress, like somebody was being tempted. Um, released closed in and sh sh um, like I, I, in the dimensional data like i felt like i was being closed in in a space like a tight space and i and, and i was closed and, and something was shut okay shut released closed in shut and i started sweating really bad or I've, I've, not me personally <laughs> Okay, but this it, I, it was almost like I was living through who whatever this target was. And I was um, I was shut in somewhere. I was very sweaty, and I started smelling this odor. Okay, and it was and and I wrote it down on the paper. It was like sweaty from a performance. Like how I, I grew up dancing in, in in performing arts, and I was a singer and all that stuff, and I played sports too. So it was almost like a locker room smell, or like after you get done with the performance, you've got on like these like polyester tights and suits and everything like your leotard uh, and you put on like um, you're super sweaty. That was what I was experiencing was like um, and I actually wrote down uh, this like the the scent that you get like backstage after everybody's like worked their butts off, you know, and um, you got that odor. OK, like sweaty and salty. OK, so I was I was feeling like super sweaty and salty and um yeah, and I, I wrote down powerful, and I was picking up on like, oh gosh, I I don't know if 
I hate talking about this, but I was, I was picking up on like pantyhose. Okay. And tights. And, um, and I, and I heard a uh, sweat equals power, sweat equals power and a trance state. Okay. So I wrote that down. Okay. And then, um, I was picking up on something to do with an initiation. Okay. An initiation, uh, something to do with some secret knowledge. Okay. Some secret knowledge. Uh, I wrote down something that was below and under, under or under and below. I heard under the radar, something was under the radar. Um, I heard target. Uh, I wrote down target and then I heard make contact. Okay. I heard that. I heard that clear audiently. Um, and then whatever this target was, was very emotional. And then it made me start crying. I got overwhelmed and started crying. I wrote down holding something was holding. And then I wrote down, um, Holder, uh, uh, there was something about secret knowledge. I kept getting this information about ancient secret knowledge. And it was almost like an initiation. And then I wrote down as above, so below. So it almost brings like an occultish element into all of this. Okay. Um, because I, I did pick up on as above, so below, ancient secret knowledge. Um, and then I heard goodbye. Goodbye. I, I literally heard somebody say goodbye. And, uh, and I ended the session right there. I only went to stage four on this one because I was so upset and um, and so overwhelmed by the data that I was getting. Um, I, it did appear that uh, somebody was taken, dragged, put under some abuse of some sort. And uh, ultimately, I, I do not believe that they're still living. So, um, so that a lot of that makes sense to me, especially the beginning when you got happy. So let's just basically recap what had happened to Mara Murray and her life just so you guys understand kind of the emotional state that she was probably in because first and foremost we don't the big question is what was she doing on that road in the middle of the night she was at this point a student at UMass University of Massachusetts in Amherst um she was 21 years old very young she had just transferred from UMass from West Point, and she was like 140, 150 miles away from the school that night. And I, and nobody knows, nobody knew she was going up there. Now I have a theory as to why she was up there. Um, so we got to back up a, a, a few. We got to go back to an incident that happened to her at West Point. Now, Mora, from what it seems, and I want to make an apology, guys. Jessica and I are from the South. And so I realized when I listened to the parents and the family speak of her, they're Boston people and Boston people have very thick New England accents. And they say Mara as Mora, Mora, where in the South, we kind of say more Mara is kind of how we say it. So I'm not, I don't want to like, it's no disrespect. That's just our accents are just different. And so, um, you know, when you hear them say her name, it's more Mora, whereas we might, and I tried to in the part one to say it their way, but you know, as as we're as we're talking about this, if we say Mara instead of Mora, that's just our Southern accent, guys. So, anyway, with that being said, Mara came from a very what it, it seems to be a very very loving family. Like she she was very loved by her her and as you can see, her dad is still fighting for to find out information about what happened to his daughter. There were five kids. Um, she had an older brother, Fred Jr. She had Julie, Kathleen, or Kathleen and Julie. Julie and Laura uh, were around the same age. And then uh, Kurt, Curtis was the younger brother. So, no, sorry, four four kids. There, were, That's four, right? There were, no, that's five. Because that was Fred, Kathleen, Julie, Mara, Curtis. So five children. Now, the younger brother, Curtis, was from her mother's second marriage. But they were very, very close. Julie and Mara were the two athletes. So they were, and the father, and that's one thing James Renner believes that the father like pushed them too hard. And, but nobody else claims that they all say the father was just coaching them. And when the parents divorced, I get that with a dad, like that's a good way for a dad to be involved in their child's life is to coach them and help them with sports. You know, that's a common, common bond a child would have with a parent. And, um, you know, and Fred has always said the minute the girls didn't want to run anymore, then that's fine. They didn't have to run anymore. But both Julie and, and Mara were not only loved running, but were exceptional runners. Like, it's like she had a scholarship to West Point. Y'all, West Point, I mean, 
they don't just accept anyone. It's a military for our, for our friends watching from other countries. This is a military school. And Julie, the older sister, had already been accepted to West Point. Then Mara got accepted. Well, I'm going to tell you guys, I love to exercise. I'm a hardcore exerciser, but I don't like being told what to do. And I would not last a week at West Point, I don't think. Because, it, you know, you go to college, most universities, you're, you got your schoolwork and stuff, but you're partying, you're kind of exploring your boundaries as a young adult, you know, you're kind of, that's kind of your dumbass dipshit years where you're kind of experimenting with, you know, but, it, and, I, and I actually think that's really healthy for kids to have that, that time when they're still kind of young, but they're also maybe making some adult decisions. So, and, but in West Point, that's not going to be the case. Like in West Point, you're not going to gain the freshman 15. Like you're on a strict regiment workout military style. And I think in a lot of ways, Mara did West Point or agreed to take, accept the scholarship to West Point because it made her family happy. So I do think she was, but that doesn't mean her family were abusive. I think a lot of us do that. And I think by the time she, she had gone before, before the disciplinary, disciplinary committee at West Point, like seven times. Um, and then she actually shoplifted makeup from Fort Knox. Yo, Fort Knox is the most secure place in the United States. Right. They make jokes about that. Like it's more secure than Fort Knox, you know? So the fact that she did this, like, and it was like nail polish or something. And it's not like she couldn't afford like. You know, for me, it was like, a, it seemed like a, and she, one of her friends, I interviewed one of her friends in one of the podcasts I listened to from West Point. And um, she said that afterwards, she was like, Mara, why'd you do that? She was like, I don't know. I don't know. But it got her kicked out of West Point, basically. And so I kind of see that as a cry for help. I don't think she wanted to be there anymore. I don't blame her. I just don't think she didn't know how to disentangle herself from that situation. She was a straight A student in high school. She did really well. She was always, you know, so when you start to, think for yourself and you, you're not, you know, I think that, I mean, I don't judge her for that basically. Um, so then she got accepted into UMass where she changed her major to nursing. Her mother was a nurse and everything. She made friends really quickly. She had this little group of girlfriends. Everything was all well and good until it was like November, 2003. So this is a few months before she disappeared. She got caught using a credit card number from another girl that lived in the dorm at, at UMass to order food. It was like $79 worth of charges. And so she got brought before a judge and the judge was like, listen, you're young. It's a, it's under $250. It's you were buying food. It's not like you were buying trips to Disney world, you know, just pay If you can pay the money back to the victim, and if you can stay clean for three months, we'll take this off your record. Which is really important because if it was on her record, it would have she would have been charged with a credit card fraud and identity theft. So she would that would affect her getting jobs in the future. That affects a lot. And so I do think this judge, she got lucky with this judge. Okay. And that was she went before the judge in December of 2003. So this is like a couple of months before she dis disappeared. All is well and good until about February 5th of 2004. And y'all, my birthday is February 4th. It's February 4th. Too. I know exactly where I was when all this started because I just turned 21 myself, you know? So I look back at that. That's what's wild. Like you look back and know where you were when somebody else around your age was going through what they were going through. Well, February 5th of 2004 is when people kind of mark the beginning of her disappearance because she had all these part-time jobs. One of them was for a security, a security job at her school. So it wasn't like, again, it wasn't like she was hurting for money. She had jobs. Her family was middle class. Like they were very supportive. Her, her stealing had nothing to do with survival. It was, it was obviously something was going on with her around 10. She got to her shift at 1030 at night around the first call she gets is from her sister, Kathleen. Now, her sister, Kathleen, had been in and out of rehab for drug and alcohol abuse. And the little brother, Kurt, people have made a big deal about this. Like, her sister must know more because her sister gets very tight-lipped. And her brother, Curtis, finally came on the Missing Mara Murray podcast and said, no, my sister, Kathleen, has struggled with drugs and alcohol because when she was 19, she was engaged to a man who committed suicide and blamed Kathleen in his suicide letter. So that that's why she that that was what was going on with his sister. It had nothing to do with Mara, but 
Anyway, Kathleen had been in some rehab facilities. She called Mara. There was some speculation that maybe Kathleen had started drinking again, and Mara was a little upset about it, understandably so. Now, around 12, midnight, her boyfriend, Billy Roush, who's been, who has been taken off as a suspect, guys, because he was like 1,700 miles away at a, at a military base in Oklahoma, he called her. They had like a seven-minute conversation that the relationship was not good. He was cheating, and they were young. They were young. He was cheating on her. It was long distance. But of course, in Mara's mind, she was going to marry this guy. You know, we've all done that as girls. Come on. Like, we've all dated a bozo that we thought we were going to marry, right? Like, I can fix him. True love will fix him. You know, she was just 21. And I mean, at 41, she probably been like, screw you, dude. Like, whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just being a 21 year old girl, right? So that night, she got really upset after the phone call with Billy, so much so to the point where she was kind of comatose, and the, the supervisor had to take her home at like 1 o'clock in the morning back to her dorm, and she wouldn't speak, but whenever the supervisor asked her what was going on, she just kept saying, my sister, my sister, so it kind of sounds like it was just two compounding phone calls. I don't think either one of them have to do with what happened, but that's where they started because it was weird. Now, on February 7th, which was that Saturday, her father, Fred, came to, to the university to visit Mara because they needed to get Mara a new car. Uh, Mara's car apparently uh, was just not drivable. The cylinder would smoke, all this kind of stuff. And so Fred had taken $4,000 out of his savings account. He was going to take Mara to some car lots, find a good used car. You know, I understand that, Jessica, you're a parent. I don't. Some people have made a big deal out of this. I don't see this as a big deal. I think any parent would want their child to be safe, especially a daughter, to be safe. She's living in Massachusetts. Um, I think Jessica and I would probably be SOL in the winter as two Georgia girls up in Massachusetts because that is some hard winters that they have to they have to go through with snow and you know all that kind of stuff. And so she was having to make rounds as a nursing student, driving back and forth to the hospital. The father just literally was like, "I need to do what I can to help my daughter out in this situation. I don't see anything weird about this at all. I think if you have the means to get your kid a, a safe car to drive in, you're going to do it as a parent." You know, and so they went car shopping that day. They didn't find anything, but that night, Fred took Mara and her girlfriend Katie out to dinner. Normal, normal. They said it was weird that they that Katie said they never talked about the car shopping. But again, like, why would they? You know, you're out to dinner with a friend. Like, why are you going to talk? You know, it's hey, girls, how's classes going? Katie, tell me about how your school's going. What What do your parents think? What are you majoring at? That's probably the conversation they were happening. So after that was over, uh, Fred took the girls to a liquor store so they could buy alcohol to go to a dorm party that night. All right. Now, of course, if you're 21, your whole social circle is probably dependent on these parties. There's probably cute boys there, whatever. At 40 or 41, if you had this three-month probation period, you probably wouldn't be going to any parties. But that's the mind. This is the mind of a young and dumb 20-year-old, 21-year-old. Now, the one thing where I questioned Fred is Fred had just, the father, had just bought a brand new Toyota. And he was staying at a local hotel and he let Mara drive his new car to this party and asked her if she would just bring it back. Now, it could be he was just trusting his daughter that she wasn't going to drink, all that kind of stuff. Well, she got to the party with her friend around like 1030 that night, got left the party around 230. And then by 330, she had had an accident in the car. So she'd come to what they call a T-stop where you could turn left or right, but she ran the car straight into the guardrail. Now, with that being said, the, the, the responding officer did not run any sobriety tests on her. We don't know why. No one knows why, because I would think that would be the first thing you would run at 3.30 in the morning with a 21-year-old girl who's been to a dorm party who just drives straight into a, a guardrail. But for some reason, he didn't do that. She got lucky. But he did file out an incident report. The car was totaled. She went back to her father's hotel. We have on record she talked to Billy, her boyfriend, at like 4.50 a.m., where she was very upset about telling her dad she'd wrecked his car. Anyway, woke up in the morning, told her father, cars wrecked, cars total. Uh, you know, he was like, at least you're safe, blah, blah, blah. So that's coming into Sunday. He brings Mara back to the dormitory and says, go Monday morning, pick up the incident report so we can still on the phone and fi file the insurance so insurance can cover this together. So... Now we start to see Mora uh, on the early mornings of February 9th, the day that she disappeared. Uh, just after midnight, she was her computer showed that she was looking up directions to the Berkshires, to a, a vacation spot common in New England area, which is in the Appalachian Mountains, the Berkshires. 
And then at 3.34 a.m., she turns in her nursing homework to her professor. And we then we see her asleep. Let me look at the timeline here. Then at 1.13 1, p.m., Mara calls another nursing student, and they found this nursing student, Erin O'Neill. She talks about how Mara, um, this was the nursing student that she would hitch rides with a lot, and Mara was basically telling her she had a family emergency come up. She was going to be leaving town, and she needed to return some clothes she had borrowed from the student. Erin was like, don't worry about it. It's fine. Just bring it when you get back. But nonetheless, Mara dropped her clothes off in a trash bag at her front door. And then at 1.24 p.m., Mara emailed a work supervisor in, in the nursing school program, so kind of like a professor, to say that there would she would be out for a while due to a death in the family. There was no death. But I think I had a few friends that pulled this in college. Like they would, if they wanted to go party for the weekend and they didn't want to do their work, they would just email the professor and be like, there was a death in the family. got to go home. I know a lot of kids do this. So this is not surprising to me. That it's an easy lie. Like it's an easy lie to, you know, so it's a bereavement period. But she also told the professor that she didn't know how long she was going to be gone. So she would let him know when she was coming back. 2.05 2.05 p.m., she called around some hotels in Stowe, Vermont, inquiring about hotel prices. 2.18 p.m., she leaves her boyfriend a voicemail saying she would call him later. 3.30 p.m., Mara's car, her beat-up car that she should not be driving, is seen leaving campus. We know at this point that they did close down classes because a snowstorm was coming. Listen, y'all. Listen. If the Yankees are going to close down school because a snowstorm is coming, you know it's a bad snowstorm. Down here in the south... They can mention that it might perhaps just kind of snow a little bit and the Piggly Wiggly sells out of bread and water and people think Jesus is coming back, right? Like these are, I, I, when if, if a school in New England is closing its doors to a snowstorm, I think that's going to be a pretty, pretty big snowstorm that she's driving into, right? Because um, those oh, yeah. kids, those Yankees, they know how to handle the snow, don't they, Jessica? Oh, yeah. I, listen, I got stuck in the um, snowpocalypse down here in Atlanta. And I was I was like nine months pregnant or seven months pregnant with my son. And I was stuck. I had a mile to drive and uh, we got black ice. And I was on the road for like four or five hours just for like a mile or it might have been longer than that. I don't remember. But I was super pregnant and I had to pee. So, yeah, <laughs> I'll never forget that. It's a nightmare down here, y'all. Yeah, (laughs) we don't get it. We don't get snow down. I mean, most of the time they they predict it might snow. It never does, right? It's just flurries or nothing. But we don't know how to handle it. We can't drive. Like when when that snow apocalypse happened, like everything shut down because we just don't know how to handle the snow. One of my best friends lives up in Toronto, Canada. And we were on the phone one day and he was like, what you doing? And he was like, I was like, I don't know, nothing. What are you doing? He's like, I'm going to get my winter tires. And I stopped for a minute. I was like, your what? He's like, my winter tires. I was like, come again? He's like, my winter tires. I was like, aren't tires just tires? So apparently even up there, they have something called winter tires. We don't we don't have any winter tires down here. Like, no. It's not. No, so y'all, y'all quit making fun of us up there. We don't have winter tires down here. Okay. No, we don't. We don't. <laughs> but I will say we, we can we can take the heat like a champ. <laughs> yeah. We know how to take the heat down here. Our, yeah. Our tires melt during the summer and we're okay with it. We can deal with that. Yeah. We, we can handle this. I mean, it's, it's, we just can't handle the snow. That's why, that's why we're called a sun belt down here. But just, I mean, when I saw that, when that, that, that the classes had canceled class, I was like, she is driving into a snowstorm that even the Yankees don't want to deal with. And for my friends watching from other countries, I know you call us Americans Yanks or Yankees, but here in the South, we call people from the North Yankees. We're not, Yankees. we're not Yankees. Listen, my grandfather's grandparents were from Philadelphia. And we don't know anything about them. Well, I know it's about the grandmother because her family was actually from the English royal family. But the Staffords, the man she married, Henry Stafford, if you're a Stafford and lives in the Philadelphia ever area, hello, I might be your cousin. But we didn't learn anything about them because they were Yankees. <laughs> How Southern is that, Jessica? We're not going to talk it's, about that side of the It's typical. Right? It's typical. Yeah, it's typical. Well, I just knew growing up, if I met anybody with the last name Stafford, I probably shouldn't be dating him. <laughs> so because I don't know how many cousins I got up there. But anyway, that is some serious business. So she is driving into a horrific snowstorm with a car that's not reliable. By 3.40 p.m., bank cameras show her withdrawing $280 from her account. Now, the bank camera footage finally was released. She was alone. There was nobody with her. They showed, uh, I, I will probably place a picture here for you guys. 
Now, $280 did basically clear out her checking account. Now, $280 in 2004, if we look back 20 years, I think Jessica probably, if she was planning on going away just for the weekend, she probably in 2004 could have managed it at 20 years ago. And now $280 is not going to get you through one day. But th then if she's, if she's living cheap, if she's, you know, as most college students do with gas, with everything. So I see that as her. Yeah, I would think at that point that would be enough sufficient if you were planning on going away for the weekend, which I'll tell you why my theory is about that later on. Um, later on, she stops by a liquor store where she spends $40 on booze. We also know that she did pick up the incident report that day at some point because they found it in the car when the car was found empty. They did find the incident. So she had gone and picked up the incident. These are important. This is important information, guys, because this shows somebody who was planning on coming back and she was planning on staying in touch with her family. If she was picking up the incident report, she was planning on talking to her dad. This to me does not does not show someone if she's turning in her nursing homework at 3.30 in the morning. Like if you're planning on disappearing, you wouldn't be turning in your nursing homework. Right. Like that's just common sense. So I think she she was not planning on, on disappearing. Right. Um, but nobody knew she was leaving town or where she was going. Uh, 347 p.m. She checks her voicemail. And this is important because this pings. We know then between four and five p.m. She was heading north on I-91 because her we know she, where she was heading at this point. Um, and then we hear nothing from her until 727 p.m. when a call is made regarding her wreck. So she pulls off of I-91 into this very small town in, in New Hampshire um, where she turns a corner and her car kind of skids. She probably hit ice. And from what I understand, where this was on Route 112, um, she this area apparently was common for, for car accidents for people, just especially when it was bad weather. So 7.27 p.m., a call is made by a neighbor regarding the wreck. Um, let's see. Then we have uh, Butch Atwood, another neighbor who is a school bus driver. At 7.30, just three minutes later, he pulls his bus up going home and stops and talks to her and asks if she needs help. But she says, oh, no, 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 no. I've called AAA. Don't worry. And he's like, let me call the police for you. And she's like, she pleads with him not to call the police. She assures him that he she has called AAA. Well, Butch knew as another neighbor, that that area did not get cell phone reception. So he knew she was lying, that she had not called AAA. So he drives his bus to his house. By between 740 and 743, he places a call to the police himself. By 746, the police show up on the scene, and she's gone. Her car is there. Uh, it's locked. There, her When they finally, when they realize it's a missing persons case, and they go into the car, they realize she's got her duffel bag with, like, clothes workout clothes makeup all like, like she's going on a trip in the car uh, obvi obviously alcohol spilled alcohol the if on the incident report but her purse is missing and her cell phone so the police figured that she actually left her car to go either go and find the cell phone reception to call a friend or find someone to help her and that was the last so Theoretically, Butch Atwood was the last person to see her alive or to see her in general. And there was a lot of speculation with Butch, but he has since passed away himself. And I think they pretty much cleared him because there were three neighbors around this. So there were three. And I wrote down some people who've been very heavily investigated in this case um, gave the window for her to vanish to be about a seven minute window. And for her now they, they had so all the different theories, guys. I'm just going to knock it out with what we know factually. She did not go into the mountains. Why do we know this? Because there were no footprints in the mountains at all. So she did. So the mountains were kind of on the side, and then she had the road going uh, both directions. People think she might have ran into the mountains. No, 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 guys. Sh there were no footprints. Like with snow that much, if the cops had seen any footprints at that time at the scene, they would have actually gone and tried to because it was cold. It was. This was February 9th. It was freezing. There was no storm. They would have gone in to find the person. There was no no, indi no indicators that she went into the woods. Now, when the police first thought she had vanished or got to the wreck and saw she wasn't there, they thought she vanished or she left 
voluntarily. Like she had just walked off to go and find cell phone reception. They didn't think anything scandalous had happened. Um, I don't even think they were suspecting drunk driving, um, even though there was alcohol spilled at this point. I think they just thought she had left to go and try to find cell phone reception. So the police have acknowledged that they, they, they butched up. They messed up the first part of this investigation. It's a small town. It's a small town. You know, in Georgia, we got a lot of those, Jessica, don't we? We do. Oh, yeah. Cops don't deal with this stuff that much in small towns, do they? Uh, not not often. I mean, I've, I've dealt with cases uh, where we had a, a very good family friend. My mom's best friend actually uh, passed away. We, we think he passed away in a fire up in northwest Georgia. Uh, that's what we were told. But um, let me, let's just say the, the detective work was shoddy. Okay, yeah. to say the least. And uh, and they had my mom and I searching through the rubble for his remains that were never found and stuff. So it, I know firsthand, okay, that uh, I don't know if it was just being overwhelmed as a depart small department, yeah. uh, but it took like three days or a couple of days to call in the GBI to come do the crime scene stuff. I mean, it was just it was just botched, in my opinion. Um, so they can't handle some of these departments are just the towns are so small, they can't handle it. No, um, they don't have the resources. They don't have the training. It's um, and that and a lot of people have you know put their tin and I'm a tinfoil hat wearer too sometimes. But with this, looking through everything, I don't think the police are covering anything up. I really because we've had multiple police officers who were involved in that first call, um, apologize profusely for not you know they they kind of did like they drove around seeing they could find her, but they kind of left except they felt like she had walked off on her own and she would be back. You know, they didn't think that anything that anything was going on. And so they they didn't call the FBI that quick. Like they really just, you know, and, and I feel bad for them because you watch so many of these officers apologize, just apologize profusely and re realizing the mistake that they made. And so I, I don't think that, you know, Fred Murray has filed a lawsuit against the New Hampshire police. Uh, they have withheld information from the, the police do apparently have more information they're willing to release to the public. I can understand both perspectives, why Fred Murray would sue because the police have not been worked with him very well, the father. and But from the police perspective, they need to hold back information because when you do interrogations, there's information they have that only maybe a remote viewer or the criminal, the perpetrator would have. And so they've held back some information regarding what they have found up until this point so i don't i don't think there was a police cover-up involved i think it was just shoddy work and i think that um yeah they were understaffed underfunded and, and i could see them assuming she people listen i've had to deal with the police i have a stalker from telegram this cold on telegram and it's been really bad and i've had to deal with the police with police reports and detectives and they also have a lot of of, of red tape they have to get through you know they're um the wheels of justice turn slowly and a lot of that is because in the, this country, people are innocent until proven guilty. So when a, a, a police jurisdiction is ready to take a, a take a, a case to the prosecutor, they have to make sure they have everything to give the prosecutor that's going to convict this person or else if they don't get the conviction, that's it. That's double jeopardy. They can't do double jeopardy. You know? So so I, I kind of see both sides of this. I think it's just shoddy work. They've apologized. I think the police are trying their best at this moment to to do what they can to help get some closure in this case. But anyway... Um, a lot of people like James Renner believe that the family might be involved. I don't think so. Did you pick up on anything with the family being involved, Jessica? No, no. I I think that <clears throat> according to the data and like after kind of analyzing it and now knowing what was going on and what happened, what this target was, I think that she was most likely picked up by somebody. Uh, she either waved a car down, she was picked up by somebody uh, just to get out of there. Okay, to get out of there, uh, she was tempted. Okay, I was picking up on somebody being tempted. Uh, I do believe she she either was tempted or she, you know, a, attempted to flag somebody down and was like, hey, let me get a ride. Um, but I think that that was just a bad decision because I think that she was she was taken <clears throat> and um, ultimately lost her life over that. I, I agree with you. I don't think she went to Canada. I don't think it was suicide. People kept saying, oh, she went out and committed. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Because nothing from her behavior leading up to this moment um, indicated that she was planning on committing suicide. She was com She was planning on coming back. You, you wouldn't send your nursing school homework in if you were not going to come. Right? 
I mean, she did pick, pack her dorm room up, like completely packed it up. So I think she was planning on being gone for a little while. My my speculation, Jessica, and I said this in part one, where she we don't know what, exactly why she was on that road because she didn't tell anybody, but she had a book in her car on hiking the White Mountains. So now she was at the foothills of the White Mountains. As a child, she used to go to the White Mountains with her family in the summertime to camp and hike. And so... I, there were some words you said in the beginning, and I can't believe, I can't, the happiness, I can't remember all the words you said. And I thought, you know, my speculation is she was overwhelmed. She had this lingering criminal charge. She had gotten into this wreck by the grace of God. She did not take a sobriety test. She had alcohol in her car. You said you think she was drinking. We still have no, you know, I think she ran from the wreck because she did. She wanted to sober up. She did not want to have. It's okay. You can get into a car accident on probation. That's not the problem. The problem is, are you drunk driving? So I think she ran. She needed to get away from the accident. I, I think she was heading up to the White Mountains. And I think she was going to plan to try to stay there for the duration of the three months. That was her prob probational period so that she didn't get in any more trouble. And I think and she only had $280 on her, but she could have probably gotten a part-time job. So I think she was removing herself from her school situation where there's a lot of alcohol, a lot of partying going on um, to decompress for a moment. I think she also was stressed out with her boyfriend and she got into this little fender bender. If she had been drinking or if she was just stressed out about being in another car accident with this pending criminal investigation, I agree with you, Jessica. She went to get away to either sober up or to get her wits about her to call a friend to come help because she did not want to be involved and tangled with the police again because that could have put potentially put the credit card theft and identity theft on her record. And I agree with you. People said, well, why wouldn't she have then taken Butch, the older man's help? Well, Butch wanted to call the police and she did not want the police involved. And I think you're right, Jessica. I think a younger person around her age pulled up because the dogs did they, they brought in dogs guys they brought the dog the dogs we don't deserve dogs dogs are just they can sniff out anything and they, they actually there's lots of breakdowns on how they've worked these dogs they've had cada cada cadaver 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 dogs go into the woods to look for a dead body they've never found anything of a human remains um by the car now that's now they've only checked a certain radius around the car it could be she's now outside of that radius her body is now outside of the area that was that was uh, they were allowed to to check but the trace dog who picked up her living scent went from the area of the car where the car was crashed like maybe 20 feet away down the road and then it stops so what does that tell you she was picked up yeah yeah i think she was picked up 100 percent um I think she was picked up. Yeah, that's that's what I think. And uh, but I think it, she was picked up by somebody that was not not a good person. Yeah, and I think she saw it as as uh, a younger person. Um, now that when the some of the psychics picked up, three men were involved. Uh, I don't know um, if there were if one of his buddies like accidentally did. He said if it was like a, a you know. I think she would have fought back. She was very athletic. She was five seven. You know, she was a you know. Uh, not, not tall, but like taller for a woman. She was, you know, she could fight. I, I think this girl could definitely fight back. Um, and I think that they started uh, possibly drinking at his house. There's an A-framed house that, that they speculate she might have been taken to, which is about half a mile to a mile away. It's down a, a side road. Um, so she would have died less than a mile from the accident if this is if the uh, the theories are correct with this A-frame house. Um, some people did find blood in the once the tenants moved out and the house was empty. People were allowed to go in there and they found blood in the closet. It has been, um, it has shown that it, that it is human blood and the people that have forensically looked at the blood uh, have found two different DNA samples. One they know is male and one is undetermined. So that still leaves that door open that it could have been Mara in that closet. Um, I think that they probably tried to, sexually do something with her and she said no and fought back and it got out of hand and maybe he called friends to remove the body um you know when you talked about the trance and being in a trance i wrote down i wrote that down disassociation did she disassociate at some point which is common 
in a traumatic experience. The sweating makes sense because your nervous system is working overdrive at that time when your life is being threatened. Yes. So, um, and yeah, I think now according to locals, locals do believe that it was what you said. That's what locals say. The gossip mm -hmm. around town is exactly yeah. what Jessica picked up on. Yeah. I can, I can see that. I mean, that's, that's really interesting. Um, if, if this is on, if my data is on target and it's a, in agreement with what the locals assume or say, uh, that's, it's really sad. First of all, it's very sad. Um, but I do, I do believe, I mean, I, I, I was picking up on her getting dragged down and put, I, I literally heard somebody say put, she's put in her place. Okay, so um, so that made me feel like, and, and they not she was knocked out as well. So I I a hundred percent believe that she was fighting. Okay, whatever happened to her, she was fighting, and uh, and whoever was attacking her felt like they had to put her in her place, and they ended up knocking her out. And whether it was accidental or on purpose, I do believe that they they harmed her, they injured her, ultimately to her death. Yeah. And when you talked about the ritualistic stuff, now this is nothing against like the Islamic faith because I have a friend who's Muslim. I'm not saying, you know, all Muslims are this way. I, I kept thinking like this is coming from a different culture where, you know, there is, and we know that in Islamic faith, they do practice a lot of occult. I mean, they do in the Christian faith too. There's a lot of occultic practices that go on as well. And, um, you know, the interesting thing that I will say, Jessica, it's like, if did you pick up on with whoever the perpetrator was did you pick up on him having help to remove the body or to move the body no i didn't i didn't i felt i felt like it was um because i heard solemn or like um alone and so i was feeling as though either that was her or whoever picked her up i was kind of picking up on like one person honestly but yeah um looking looking back at it yeah i think it was i i feel like it might have been just one person not to say there weren't more, but that's kind of what my sensory data was. I I kind of just common sense wise, I kind of questioned the three people too, because if you got three people involved in this, and this has become, this was considered you guys the first social media case, right? This because Facebook was invented the same week she went missing. And so there has been documentaries done over this girl, podcasts. I mean, this girl is now famous basically, um, and so if three people are involved in this, what's the likelihood that one of them might have told someone else? It's really high. Uh, yeah, it would be a lot harder to get away with this and for this to be a cold case for so long had other people been involved. That's yeah. that's just the facts. Yeah, so I, I thought the same thing. It had to either been, it had to have been one person is my perception. Um now there could have been people could have picked up on other people being there because they could have had like a little house party where she was drinking at someone's house and other people were around and the incident didn't happen until after everyone left, you know, where he tried to, I think there was probably assault involved. I don't know if you picked up on that. I think he probably did. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got dragged and abused. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I know, you and know, knocked out. not yeah. knocked out too. She fought back. Good, good for her. You know, and um, now, Jessica, do you think, does your spidey senses, do you think that this case, that her body will eventually be found? I don't, I don't know. I can't say. Um, I did not, okay, when, when I'm uh, given targets of missing persons, a lot of times, uh, it, by the end of that target, I can, some of the data will suggest, like, where the body is or where it will be found. I did not pick up that here. So... I can't say for sure. Um, I didn't. I didn't have any kind of acknowledgement of like finding a body or anything like that. Um, because, like I said, you know, I just had to set a number, so I didn't even know what I was looking at. Um, right. But, uh, but no, I didn't pick that up. I've had a big question mark that too about that too. Because Appalachia, you guys, like this is the heart of Appalachia. How many people go missing in Appalachia just hiking and you never find their bodies? Because it is, it is. We're talking about extreme elements of nature. We're talking about, I mean, animals, wild animals digging up the remains. It's been twenty years. Um, I know Alice Dubois said this case is very solvable. 
Um, and again, we don't know what the police have. I know that the guy who owns the A-frame house at the time of, of her disappearance, his brother found a knife in the, in the glove compartment with blood on it. At first, he tried to turn it into the police department. They turned it down. And he tried again. They took it. But nothing has ever come out about their findings forensically on that knife. They've never released it to the public. They never. They won't acknowledge it to the public. Part of me feels like that maybe they did find something on, ahead on that knife, and they are not going to release it because of the sensitivity of this investigation. Um, but I don't know. So, you know, um, do you think, Jessica, that her soul is at rest, or do you think her soul is still... Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'd like, I'd like to, I'd like to think that, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't make direct contact with her. Okay. Um, I mean, I was, I was seeing things through her eyes, but I never did a deep mind probe on her, um, because I was, you know, I, I just, I didn't do a deep mind probe on her because I, it was so emotional. This target was so emotional and I was, um, I was playing out there were all these scenarios like playing out in my head and stuff and so i mean i could always go back and we can hit this target again one day and uh and try to make contact with her and find out now that i know what the target is you know um do a little front-loaded target on it and uh and try to contact her I or just just get in her head and find out what happened that's the most important part we want that soul to be at rest you know if the body is yeah. gone we want the soul to move on and to be at rest and be at peace um, with what happened to the, the trauma that I mean, and I will say I will reiterate again, you guys, and I know that's really hard for family members and friends to hear because Alison Dubois said the same thing, like, is the family going to see this because it just makes me emotional because obviously her death was not a fun one. It was not, there was obviously a lot of, of, of trauma involved. Um, and it sounds like maybe when she did get knocked out, that was a blessing because then she wasn't conscious for the rest of whatever happened to her um, that night. Um, because, and I, I feel bad for her because she was so obviously so stressed out at this time in her life. And she was trying to course correct. You know, I talked about in my episode, my deep dive, you know, there were speculations of her having an eating disorder, which um, I've said before, many athletes, I said this, this deep dive, many athletes have eating disorders because it's it's a type of control and when you I, I guess you would probably know this as a, a dancer jessica when you're when you feel lighter in your stomach you're able to have more control over your body we uh, we see this in the yoga world a lot there are a lot of colleagues i have in ashtanga that i know have eating disorders you know and it's, it's 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 a need to control but not from the same place that people who aren't athletes and develop this type of disorder it's it's so we know there was a lot of anxiety and a lot basically a lot of stress in her mind and a lot of um you know in a lot of ways i felt like things i think she felt like things were unraveling which looking back you know if that had happened to her at 40 she probably would have just been like thank you judge i'm just gonna sit at my home for three months and go to school and not be tempted by parties in order to get this off my record but you know being being even though she was 21 she's technically adult your frontal brain isn't developed until like 25 she was still for all intent purposes a kid you know um, and, um, it's, it's, it's so sad and it just shows you how in a split second, something, one decision we make could like change the trajectory of everything. And I, I think she was up in that area because of the stress in her life, but I don't think the person who killed her had anything to do with what was actually going on in her life. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, my take on it would, it would be like a complete stranger to her. Well, you guys, that's, it's a very heartbreaking case. And um, if you have not, again, if you're watching this and you don't know anything about Mara Murray's case, I have my part one, I'll put that in the description box below. Um, and there are so many documentaries out there. Uh, Maggie Furling did a great docu-series on this case. And um, there's there's the Missing Mara Murray podcast. I would love, Jessica, I would actually really like, have you ever been up to New England to that area? I mean, well, I was just in New York. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> so, City or state? Uh, yeah, no, I, I have not been to like Massachusetts or Connecticut or any of those states. No, I've been up there. It's not I'm my reading. favorite place in the world. No offense to our friends who are from New England. Um, <laughs> I've been in Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, it's it's there's like a different feeling up there than down here in in the southeast. Um, 
it's, it's a lot of very, very small towns, smaller than some of our towns down here in the South. And I actually, I mean, I would be curious, Jessica, to go up there, our, if you would ever want to go up there ourselves to this area and see where she had the accident. They have it marked off now. There's constantly a bow around it. People are constantly going up there. Um, and, and to see, you know, because she is right, she's like 90 miles or something from the Canadian border. She is very close to the Canadian border. But um, just to kind of get a, uh, you know, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is this area, we've said it before, man versus Appalachia, Appalachia is always going to win. Like, it's just, it's a rough area. It's rough. You know, if you get t stuck in those woods, her body, you, you know, it's, it's anyway, anyway, I, I, it's, it's, yeah. It's well, you know, her. okay. Just, just to tie this in, I know this has nothing to do with Sasquatch and Bigfoot, but you know, I, I did, I did state at the beginning of the show that I am ultimately a Bigfoot field researcher. Okay. And that's how I learned remote viewing was through my team. And, uh, and I'm often asked, like, why, why have you guys never found a body of a Bigfoot? Well, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And um, anything, and, and I do a lot of my research in the Appalachian Mountains. And, uh, and that some of the guys on my team have actually been to the body farm in Tennessee and, uh, and done a lot of, um, of work there. And that's where they put the bodies out to study the decomposition of bodies. Okay. And, uh, and bodies, they disintegrate quickly. Yeah. Okay. A lot of them. And uh, there's scavengers out there like animals. <clears throat> there's there's a lot of times like you, you don't ever see a bear, a dead bear in the woods and things like that because they disappear so rapidly uh, with those decomposition decomposition rates, especially in the, you know, like in, in the Appalachians in Georgia, that's the Chattahoochee National Forest is a is sort of like a rainforest. <clears throat> I mean, yeah. literally. And so it's very humid up there. And uh, and so n nothing sticks around for very long once it's once it's passed away in the woods. That's a good point too, because when bodies die in civilization and they take them into a funeral parlor, they, they inject certain chemicals into the mm -hmm. body to preserve it a little bit longer in order to have open caskets. But when you don't have any of that and the body's just dumped, it is probably going to disintegrate pretty quickly. And that could have been some of the odor you were smelling too. I thought about that, Jessica, when you said the odor, not only the sweat from the trauma, but you know, apparently when you first die, your bowels release... You know, there's a lot of smells that come off the body because the organs start to shut down. You know, it's why death smells so bad. You see people having to put like either stuff under their lip when they go to a morgue or cover their nose because it's just such a, it's our, I, I've never smelt a dead human body, but I've obviously smelt dead animal bodies out in the woods and it is a gnarly smell, you know, so um, when that life leaves the body. So yeah, it is, um, I feel my heart just goes out to all of her family, to her father and her siblings and to have to have that knowledge. Again, they are very accepting. It seems that they, they're realistic that she's probably dead. Um, and they think foul play fell upon her. And I, I, I think so too. And so, and I, like I said, I don't think James Renner is a bad dude for thinking that she's living some life up in Canada. I think that's the natural response for human beings to want to think that somebody is alive and well and happy. Um, but I just don't think that's the case um, at all. So I think it just was happenstance that she was close to the Canadian border. I don't think it was anything else but that. So, well, thank you for doing this, Jessica. If y'all want, we'll do, I've got, I know I've got, another, I just gave Jessica targets for a new case for Gnostic TV. But um, if you guys want us to like do more missing people cases, especially cold cases, let us know some, give us some, or give me some names. Cause I, I don't remote view. So give me the name. <laughs> I'll do the research into the, what we know about the case. And then I'll give Jessica the coordinates so she can get what she knows about the case. So anything else you want to close out with today, Jessica, where can people oh, find wow. you? Where can people yeah, find you? Well, thank you for having me today. This has been a, a very interesting case. And I think it was, it's pretty cool that I actually feel like this was, this data was a pretty on target. Okay, for whatever happened, I do believe. Uh, now, people can find me at thecryptedhuntress.com. Uh, all my shows are there. I'm actually, um, I have a YouTube channel called The Cryptid Huntress, and uh, where I do live shows all week. And I'm also a host at Spaced Out Radio every weekend, Saturday and Sunday night. Uh, you guys can find all my shows there. But yeah, mostly just all over social media and stuff. I'm The Cryptid Huntress. So thank you for having me today. Of course. And I have to say, I don't. I think I was talking to someone about you off camera. I can't remember if it was off camera or on camera, but I was like, 
how badass is the name Jessica Jones for what you do? To be a cryptid huntress, to have the name Jessica Jones? It was like Darvick. I feel like Jessica Jones, cryptid huntress. Like, it's just so badass. I was like, oh it's a perfect name for, for a woman who's going to be doing what, what, what you do. You guys, I will put all of those links down in the description box below. I know um, somebody actually commented the other day, who is that girl you were talking about that does the remote viewing? And I just wrote the cryptid huntress go look her up she's awesome so and and you'll be doing guys this is obviously i plan on doing a lot with jessica we want to do some locational stuff too um and so uh, just let us know you guys if you there's a really interesting case that you want us to it doesn't have to be a missing persons case either guys like we did the bell witch on gnostic tv um i've got another case on gnostic tv that just was going to be doing that's not necessarily missing persons not necessarily um so it can be just any strange weird stuff you want us to look into i can do the research and then i can give jessica the coordinates just let us know and we'll figure out as ram Dass says we're all just walking each other home so we're just going to walk each other home together even if we don't know quite the directions well we're going to try to figure it out so <laughs> so anyway guys well i hope you guys are having a wonderful start to your thursday this is going to be airing on thursday and um yeah let us know your thoughts and your theories down in the comment section below Bye, everybody.